Hello. After the Bible and related work like the Quran, no single book has influenced our culture, perhaps even influenced us personally, than Alice in Wonderland. Only the work of Shakespeare and possibly Jane Austen, the Brontes and C.S. Lewis uh, match the emotional pull of the Hatter, the March Hare and Alice herself. But Alice didn't just change Lewis Carroll's life, she continues to change lives to this day. <laughs> My name is Graham Ovenden, I'm an artist, and my interest in Lewis Carroll is mainly visual. My name is Anne Clark Amor. I'm an author, and I've written biographies of Lewis Carroll and of Alice. I'm Brian Sibley, I'm a writer and a broadcaster, and my fascination with Lewis Carroll began when I was five years old and read Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. My name is Edward Wakeling, I'm a mathematician, I've been interested in Lewis Carroll and the Alice books for many years, and I'm currently editing Lewis Carroll's Diaries. I'm Alan White. My interest started with book illustration, and I started collecting different editions of Alice. My name's Charlie Lovett. I'm a Lewis Carroll collector and scholar. I'm also a writer, and I occasionally write things that have nothing to do with Lewis Carroll. Out of curiosity, Charlie, um, how many, because you, you collect do you collect Alice mm -hmm. stuff? How, how many copies of Alice in Wonderland have you got? Oh, I hate that question. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Are we talking? <laughs> I, I honestly don't know. I, I've Give been... me a ballpark figure. Three, say, say three thousand, maybe. Best part of a tidy few. Yeah, best part of a tidy few. Yeah. And what, what started you on Alice? More than forty-two. Well, did Alice become a? Actually, obviously, a lot of us read Alice in Wonderland. And it's another book that we read, but but for all of you, a, a, a very different situation occurred. That Alice, in some ways, and and correct me if I'm wrong, um, has taken over your lives. I actually started out listening to these old scratched up records of Cyril Richard reading Alice mm. uh, up in the attic on rainy afternoons. And for years, he was the only Alice that I knew. And he's marvelous. I still think he's one of the great readers of Alice. Um, and I can remember reading the book for the first time at some point in childhood. And it was this revelation because the records had all these scratches and skips and things in them, and I got to fill in all the missing bits. You know? um, but but that's where it started for me. And then. Um, and why did it continue? Book collecting. Uh, I, yeah. My father was a book collector. He collected. He collect. Still does collect different editions of Robinson Crusoe. Mm. So for me, it was you know getting obsessed with his obsession, and then thinking, oh well, yeah, you could collect different editions of some book that you like, like maybe Alice in Wonderland. Gosh, there, there must be 50 or 60 different editions of that, you know, that'll keep me busy for a couple of years. Little did you know. Uh, I had no idea that it was, it was going to turn into a lifetime obsession. Mm. You know, one of the things that I find so extraordinary is that when I first read this book, I was about oh, five or six, I suppose, uh, I was read it in a big storybook for children. No illustrations whatsoever. There were lots of other illustrations in the book, but Alice, which was serialised, Wonderland, this is, which was serialised through the book, didn't have any pictures at all. So I didn't know what these characters looked like as drawn by John Tenniel. I had no idea. It, it's like a play, in fact. Lewis Carroll invites you into a theatre yes. and he says, there's this tree and underneath it is a king asleep or there's two characters standing side by side who look like identical twins or there's a wall and on top of it is an egg but maybe it's a man. He gives you characters and then gives you these wonderful conversations. Alice, mm -hmm. of course, complains at the beginning of the book that her sister is reading a book <laughs> which doesn't have any pictures and conversations. And what's the point of a book without pictures and conversations, she says. But the conversations in this book, which I read, no pictures, lovely, wonderful conversations. I didn't discover Tenuous pictures for years and years and years. And when I did, and I knew by this time knew the story is almost sort of like word perfect, uh, the illustrations came as, a, as an extraordinary kind of revelation to me. I see them as I think they are extraordinary works of draftsmanship. And, and the, the bond between Lewis Carroll and Tenniel is, is absolutely extraordinary. Ask anybody to draw or say something about the, the Hatter, or the Mad Hatter as they call him. Lewis Carroll never does call him the Mad Hatter. And they'll tell you that he has a label in his hat. Yeah, In this style, ten and six. That's what Tenniel did in the picture. He mm. showed 
the price tag is on the hat. Lewis Carroll never says that, and yet almost every illustrator since yeah. has put a price tag on the hat, and some of them have been really daring. Peter Blake made it five shillings, knocked mm. down price. Yeah. Uh, Ralph, uh, <laughs> Arthur Rackham made it eight and eleven pence, but they've all stuck a price well, They haven't all, but many of them yeah. have stuck a price tag in there. Has he got a price tag on the other he side? Certainly has. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 like it's, it's, um, isn't that one of the contradictions <laughs> that um, the book itself, the writing, is timeless, mm -hmm. and, and I suspect if you could actually persuade children to read it these days. They, they'd enjoy it. But it has to be updated by the illustrations because the illustrations date much more than the words do. And people have, haven't they? Tenniel, perfect though it was, was a 19th century mm. straight out and of punch And yet the Tenniel illustrations have entered the cultural... Mm. You know, Absolutely. It's, it's not nonsense so much no, as... No, it's, it's sort of uh, logic turning logic on its head. But, and you can imagine he got that from actually hearing a child say yeah. something. I mean, if you take, for example, in Looking Glass, and Humpty Dumpty, who is a sort of fairly strong-willed, argumentative type of character, a bit like an Oxford Don, I guess, um, probably modelled on one, um, is trying to convince Alice that birthdays are not the best things to have, but unbirthdays are. Mm. It's a very simple logic. And, of course, Alice then realises, well, they're going to be 365 minus one of those. I'll get lots more presents. You can just imagine that that conversation must have happened with a real child, and it tickled him. He thought, hmm, fill that in. And yeah. there are so many instances like that that, you know, he probably drew that from his discussions with children. I think yeah. he also had this ability to, uh, to know when the child is going to call the bluff, you mm. know, uh, on the logician. I mean, the, the example from Alice when he... They talk about how many hours a day do you do lessons, you know, ten hours the first, nine the second, or what do you do after ten days? And it's always, suppose we change the subject, and there's several places like that where, yes. where there's mm. something logical put forward that is, in fact, illogical, mm. and Alice calls the character on it, and the other character says, suppose we change the subject. But isn't, isn't, there's a very interesting aspect to that, Charlie, which is the fact that where that happens, there's a, a, a distinct feeling of dis-ease about the book. There's, it's, it's an uncomfortable moment when that happens. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that one of the reasons that people have, be, have projected so many ideas, so many theories onto this book, these books, is because there are these moments. There are these moments which seem to mean something, seem to portend something which is not delivered in the text. And so people have mm. sprung from that to say, well, what does this mean? Why is this here? What is, what is he saying? Why is he playing that kind of a game? Why does the game suddenly go rather dark? You know, so people have taken those and said, from this we can now build whatever we want to build. Mm -hmm. But what I think is interesting about what Edward said is, is Alice is a Victorian child, a real child, but she's also a child for all time. I mean, mm. and you wrote a biography of the original Alice, Alice Little. Yes. How far is the Alice in the book a real Victorian child of the times? Well, I, I think she is totally untypical of Victorian <laughs> children, and I think that this was um, part of the original secret of, of the book's popularity with children. Uh, she is totally independent. She thinks for herself. Um, she's never fazed by what happens to her. She deals with situations as they arise. and. Um, uh, she was independent. She's not a child to be seen and not heard. She mm -hmm. wants to be heard all the time, and she is. And I think children like this, especially girls, you see. Yeah. Isn't, isn't that because the other characters in the book are, are the adults? Yes. And they're as unreasonable in the book as adults are in real life. Yes. Mm -hmm. Except in the book, she could react to them in the way that, that children would wish to react and take it one stage further mm -hmm. and actually do something about it. Yes, yes. Which no I Victorian right. child would be allowed mm. to do. No. I think you're talking about the loss of the state of grace, aren't you, really? And whereas an adult, you're, I think, and was it Elgin Blackwood said, that, you know, the adults become one board or whatever the word is. And uh, by the very nature of becoming an adult, you walk away from the state of grace. Alice stays there as the cantus firmus, you know, and, and, and as you say, doesn't sort of remove herself at all from that situation. Mm -hmm. Therefore, she becomes, I think, a character rather like Sherlock Holmes, very, very attractive, totally uncorrupted and uncorruptible. Mm. I'd like to go through, because I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the fact that this, this one single book and person has, has spawned 
so many myths and so many theories. I'd, and I'm interested to know if any of you actually agree with any of these. I've got a, I've got a list of, um, of uh, some of the theories. The fact that Lewis Carroll was Jack the Ripper, which I'd take it. None of oh, you, was um, it? <laughs> <laughs> support the theory of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Lewis that, Carroll that was, was an opium eater. Milne. Of course, um, Alice in Wonderland's become a very um, um, druggy book over the years, hasn't it? Well, I think, in fact, the main painkillers which are uh, contemporaneous with Carol Dodson was uh, laudanum in any case, wasn't it? And, and things like chloral, which are really rather he, he, potent things. He believed in homeopathy and yes. he certainly took things like arsenic and aconite in very small doses, I hasten to add, mm -hmm. uh, to get rid of a cold. But mm. uh, he certainly wasn't experimenting with drugs. He, he wasn't. Didn't. He was not. Mm. And certainly he, he couldn't stand people smoking either. Mm. There are yeah. a number of references to smoking where he's not at all happy with that. Mm. Except when he became um, curator of the senior common room, where he actually arranged for a smoking room to be built separate from the other rooms. Mm -hmm. And it was his duty to actually um, order the requirements of the, uh, for, of, of the dons in terms of their cigarettes and tobacco. And he puts a notice on the board on one occasion that says he's been sent this wonderful tobacco and he can honestly say he's never tasted better. <laughs> now, you see, it's, it's a joke because he hasn't tasted it at all. <laughs> but I think you know, this, that was typical. this is a program about obsession. I think Lewis Carroll yes. himself was obsessed with quite a few things. And I think his own health at times was one of those things. He writes yes. at some length in his uh, diaries about um, you know problems he's having with his knee and colds mm -hmm. and all sorts of different mm -hmm. things. And I think it's without a doubt that if he had been experimenting with psychedelic drugs, he would certainly have reported about it. You know, he, he, didn't, would, have, he, he didn't would have had no to. qualms about writing it down in his diary. No, nothing. He didn't need to. He had a very good imagination. I, I think that I think that's the key. That, that I think in the 1960s, when the theories about you know Alice mm. was based on a, a drug-induced hallucination came out, it was a time in our period where, unfortunately, and this is continuing to happen. Uh, television and popular culture in general was removing the necessity for people to have their own imaginations and makes them hard makes it hard for people to understand how someone could have had such a good imagination but it's also to do with well that's absolutely key to it isn't it because that's exactly the problem people cannot believe that somebody could have created a place like wonderland or looking glass world and this runs to the whole gamut of people just basically trying to identify who the characters are to say oh this character is based on that person as though if you can identify the hatter that might have inspired the hatter in the story then that somehow or other makes it okay to have, have had the imagination and the inspiration to have created this extraordinary character, because then it's within our grasp. Mm. But we shouldn't be surprised at the psychedelic interest that was shown in the 60s, because what happens there is people who are experiencing mm. certain types of hallucinatory experiences suddenly remember that they've read a book which had similar kind of feelings in it. They could have turned to anything written by Blake, except it would probably have been rather more impenetrable than Alice. Mm. Uh, or they could have turned to Coleridge, or they could have turned to any number of other writers who've looked at dream worlds. They turned to Carol and they saw within, and there are things there, for goodness sake, let's be honest, that have helped that idea. I mean, there's a caterpillar who smokes a hooker, for instance. Mm. So that became a kind of key it's image. It's a clue. Does it, does it annoy you? It seems to annoy you a little bit about the... the, the it annoys thing. me about as much as you're saying that our lives have been taken over by Alice, which you said sort of about ten minutes ago, because it's a simplification. It's a way of just saying, let's stick a label on that and say that's the answer. I'm sorry. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's interesting, though, thinking, remember that Carol now has a major reputation as a visual artist because of his photography. One must never underestimate his importance now in terms of 19th century photography. And it's interesting, his photographic images are very uncluttered, very objective. I mean, what make them sort of quite remarkable? I mean, like, here's one of the great classics. Well, you also got Alice as a beggar, but the Terry family, the great Ellen Terry and her sisters. Yeah. Yeah. And the interesting thing is, if you look at that and compare it with most other 19th century portrait photography, it's a wonderful, clear and precise view of an instant of time of a Victorian family. But the actual imagery itself does not actually breathe the 19th century in particular, does it? It could be anybody's backyard, any family almost. And there's great vitality and movement between the figures. Alice, I mean, is a beggar child, is the eternal child in a way. She doesn't look particularly 19th century, does she? I mean, that's one of the interesting things of that. Absolutely not. <laughs> Thank you.
We didn't know you if I mentioned another theory. Probably, but go on anyway. <laughs> 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 the night is a bit young. Mm. It is that. Well, we um, we've talked. I, I, I don't want to say this, but I, but I feel as if I need to say it. <laughs> you, you've um, got it written down. People, so well, it's said. not so yeah. much because I, I do have free will, but people would be people would be thinking this. I'm sure. Tom, we've talked a lot about Alice's relationship with young children, and of course, it's it's that's had a lot of bad press over the years. People have called. Um, Lewis Carroll a paedophile, or if he wasn't a paedophile, that he wanted to be a paedophile. Is 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 this? A, is this? A, are you all now furious with me for even? This is one of the myths that you mentioned. At yeah. the beginning. it is a myth. Mm. Uh, there is not a shred of evidence to support what you've just said. But unless you've got some, I mean, maybe yes, we could start by what, knowing what the thing is that we... I seem to be becoming the enemy of the group. What have you been fed all the wrong information, <laughs> sadly? I, I just... I just <laughs> not only is there not any evidence. Evidence. Can I be contentious and say, there's an Anatole France, I think, uh, chastity is the strangest of all sexual perversions. Mm. And we are going through a process of fundamental chastity at the moment, where, if you like, the uh, agents of protection have become the perverts. Mm. And actually, we have a looking glass situation, basically. Yeah. The fact that uh, the agents of protection in this country of children have become the corruptors of children. Mm. The Johnson, protectors in fact, of the children. Yes, uh, the, um, I think it was Kenneth Clark, uh, to give him another quote, that if a nude fails to arouse, it is both false art and false morals. <laughs> if you take, in fact, if you like, the natural sensuality of the human body and take that as a biological fact, if you like, and also a spiritual fact, you have no problems. If you actually then introduce what we call religion, you'll find that religious morality is based on bigotry and neuroses. Are, I can't be more contentious than that, but that's my sentiment <laughs> on the subject. Well, mm. I think, in fact, society is now acting as the corrupter mm. against children. Well, people, you know, you, you brought in the word religion as, as, a, mm. um, as a way of justifying the fact that, that morality can be a bad thing, but morality surely is something that just arises from a collective morality, consciousness. Morality now is politically manipulated and by the tabloid mentality. I mean, I think one of the, the key points is that morality is different in different times. And I think mm. one of the great things that Lewis Carroll has suffered from mm. is being a 19th century man who is being judged by now late 20th, almost 21st century standards of morality. Mm. And uh, yes, some of the things that he did, if he did them today, we would think, you know, He's taking pictures of young girls without any clothes on. He shouldn't be doing that, you know. But there was nothing amor or anti-moral or, or, you know, it was not... I to add, in fact, this is a problem of the Protestant uh, Anglo, uh, um, Anglo Catholic traditions that you'll find that what you've just said there is peculiar only to America and England. This is not a worldwide problem. Mm -hmm. And this is, in fact, where, again, the neuroses, self-generated neuroses, is acting as a destructive process. Well, I think it's even worse in America than it is in England because, of course, you sent all the Puritans over to our country to found it and have been suffering that. from it ever since. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it, it, you know, this is a profound area of discussion because it, it, we are talking about, if you like, the destruction of a of a state of a state of grace almost. We're almost denying children the ability to have the state of grace any longer. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've, if you like, we've neglected to have the songs of innocence and gone straight into the songs of experience. Yes. And um, Dodson, as a human being, was thoroughly admirable in every possible way. He was not only a gentleman in the old-fashioned sense of the word, but he was a very kind human being. And I can say he'd be the very first man I would wish my daughter to go to tea with. <laughs> I think <laughs> you, know, you said something after. before about he's been accused of being a pedophile or, or wanting to be a pedophile. And if you look at that second, I mean, we know the first is very easy to refute because there's, there's loads and loads of evidence that he spent millions of hours with young girls and none of them ever had any complaint about it, having it be anything mm -hmm. but a, one of the best relationships of their lives. Yes. So that, it's easy to dismiss that first um, accusation. The second accusation is a little harder to dismiss because it's a question of what's going on inside the man's head. Mm. And there's no way to answer that question. Well, but I would argue, I, mean, I would argue that if, in fact, that is what was going on in his head, then we should admire him all the more because it's it's very easy for me to sit here and be around a bunch of young girls and not and not uh, express any inappropriate feelings if I don't have any inappropriate feelings. How much more difficult for me to not express them if I do have them? You know, and so um, I think either way you you, know, you have to admire the the relationships that he built with these um, young girls who, and of course, later on in his life, his so-called child friends, many of them were in their twenties by then. Mm -hmm. um, 
And to every single one of them, um, in later reminiscences and in, in uh, interviews and recollections and things of this sort, um, has nothing but wonderful things to say about this relationship. Mm -hmm. I was you... wondering about the Edwardian postcard phenomena. I mean, were our grandparents perverts, in fact, because they used to send naked photographs of children through the post? Well, right. I mean, I've got 20,000 of them at home, actually, so, I mean, it wasn't a sort of an unusual phenomena. Well, isn't, well. isn't this what, what you're saying, Charlie, that you have to see somebody within the context of the time exactly. when they were? Mm -hmm. uh, and if you take somebody like Lewis Carroll and, and you talk about Lewis Carroll photographing children in the nude, and you talk about that in isolation as though that was something which today may seem extraordinary, bizarre, unsavory, whatever interpretation you want to put on it. But if you then put that within the context of the fact that a great many, well, nearly all the photographers of the period were experimenting with photographing people and children in the nude, mm -hmm. that a great photographer like Rylander, that uh, Julia Margaret Cameron, who was a woman, what are we supposed to read into that if we're going to pursue this argument, right. uh, also photographed children in the nude, that this was a common... Uh, development of people's the way in which people looked at children at the time. You could know, I, just, could I just sort of sum it up and say simply that the nude is an integral part of Western culture in terms of the visual arts, I, and we don't right. actually have an age limit where it starts no, and where it right. ends. Okay. And if you look for the great galleries of the world, I mean, go down to the Outer Pinatitech in Munich and see a painting like Rubens, The Massacre of the Innocents, which is one of the most powerful paintings with children in it. Uh, I mean, it's a very disturbing painting. All right, art is often about disturbing matters. Mm -hmm. uh, if you actually take that as your starting point, well, the whole argument of child nakedness and nudity, incidentally, the statutes which exist in this country do not forbid child nudity in photography. You said that the, that the, that the joy of, of Alice and Lewis Carroll in general is the innocence and... And I said the state of grace. The state uh, this of is a, you must remember that the garden, the Edenic state, mm. is an amoral state. Mm. It's there for both good and evil, mm. if you like, darkness and light. Mm -hmm. Well, all I was going to say, I wasn't going to say anything contentious. All I was going to say was that it's a very, it's a very complex book, the puzzles and the mm. conundrums and the clues and the riddles. And these aren't things you associate with a, an anti-education, which is, which is what you're talking about. Uh, William Blake, I do not hold with education, it is the great corruption. Mm. Mm. Oh, there's education in education, mm. isn't there? There's a state of grace, which is a state of truth, if you like. There is innocence and there's naivety. Naivety is not a quality to be recommended at any level. Innocence possibly is, if we know what it is in the spiritual sense, and the state of grace is definitely to be recommended. We start off life in the state of grace, we lose it by the process and corruption of education. And then, if we're actually so inclined, we then spend the rest of our life trying to reattain it. Yeah. At least that's my sort of general well, philosophy on it. I think it's interesting that you bring up the notion of Lewis Carroll and education, because it, on the surface it would seem that he'd be all in favour of it. I mean, after all, he was an educator. He worked mm -hmm. at, a, at a university, naturally. But, and it's but, an educational book in some but respects. I think, yeah, I think if you look at it, I think his ideas of education were had a lot less to do with what we think of as education, mm. a classroom, a lecture, mm. a, a paper, and it had much more to do with um, sort of doing things. I mean, back to the photography, he would involve the children in what was going on. He took them into, up to the studio and into the dark room and let them see all the chemicals being mixed, and it was an exciting thing. And I think for him, the, the relationship with the children was, was educational by way of respecting the child's individuality and and involving the child in everything that was going on, rather than shutting the child up someplace and saying, you, you go off here and be educated and we'll see you when you're done. Charlie, yeah. there's, there's more to it. I mean, he, he understood that you remember, you learn, if you are enjoying yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Very if it's true. an unpleasant experience, you're going to promptly forget it. <laughs> um, and so certainly with his dealings with children on a one-to-one -one basis, it will be puzzles and games, conundrums, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I think even with his um, undergraduates, uh, he had to fight very hard against those that thought you simply had to just fill up their empty container heads with knowledge. And I don't think he really went along with that. I think in his mathematics, uh, he was always trying to get them to think, use their heads. Uh, he, there's a lovely anecdote of a, of a puzzle that he used to give them about a rule of three. And he used to say, now, if it takes four men um, four days to build a wall, how long will it take 60,000 men to build a similar wall. Now, see, it's a mathematical rule of three. You can work it out 
mathematically, numerically, exactly what the answer is, and it'll come out to be a fraction of a few seconds, I suppose. But the point is, if 60,000 men are building a similar wall, the vast majority can't get anywhere near the wall. And he was trying, he was trying to get his students to realise that it was an impossible situation. The real situation is such that, you know, mathematics in that case does not apply. Mm. And I think he was trying to use that. Out of curiosity, by the way, um... Wasn't he a reverend? He was a deacon of the Church of England. Mm. You are proponents of a, of a theory yourself, and aren't you, that, that he was in love with Alice's mother? No, I'm not. No, <laughs> never. Uh, <laughs> not no, in this room. Certainly really? not. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> I, I don't go along with that theory, not at all. Um, one reason for this, for, firstly, I have seen no evidence whatsoever, and I've done a lot of biographical research, um, which even suggests this. There's not even a hint of it. Mm. But secondly, he was not a man whose moral principles would have allowed him to fool around with married women. Mm. Now, when Ellen Terry, uh, left her husband, uh, the artist G.F. Watts. Mm. Um, he met her and they became friends. He became friends. Of course, there he's photographed the whole Terry family. But he became a friend of Ellen Terry. But when, although she'd left her husband, she went and often lived with a man as if she were his wife, he cut the relationship altogether. But when, years later, this man left her and she actually, having um, been divorced by her husband, uh, married somebody else, he then went to her mother and said, do you think that, that she would now be willing to um, uh, renew the friendship? And Ellen Terry uh, agreed immediately. I can't say I would have been as forgiving <laughs> as she was. I think you're talking about good old-fashioned hypocrisy, aren't you, really? <laughs> well, I, I think, um, you know, you said something about how he wasn't the sort of person who would fool around with married women. I think that's quite true. As Edward said, one of the conditions of his studentship was that he remain unmarried. And while he could well, have decided... Well, celibate or as well. Celibate, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, he could have decided to, to give that up, to, to get married, to go off and... and but. Uh, he, I believe, from an early age, knew that he wanted to pursue a career as a scholar and as a writer, and he liked the mm -hmm. idea of being in that mm -hmm. room all alone with those books and those blank sheets of paper. And if he didn't get married, he could keep that room with those books and those blank sheets of paper. And I think that's part of the reason that he sought the companionship of the opposite sex in, in two forms. One was young girls, uh, and the other was married women. He was a great flirt with married women. And I think mm. the reason that he liked these two groups is because they were completely safe. In, in, in neither case mm. would there be a threat that the relationship would evolve towards marriage. You know? mm. But there's more yeah. to, to being in love with a young girl than that. Maybe it would, was he in love with the idea of, of, of a innocent, unsullied, pure person? Well, that would tie in with the whole 19th century attitude to the girl mm -hmm. child in particular. I mean, we're not talking about an isolated incident with Dodson and his relationships. I mean, that go goes for the whole of the 19th yeah. century. The whole notion of the, the yeah. child fresh from the yeah. hands of God. In fact, know. that really, it probably it's the First World War that it's destroys that vision of the, of the child as, the, if you like, the angel. And then the child is rapidly becoming now the angel demon. Mm -hmm. And we don't know quite where it stands. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it's a very interesting phenomenon in a way in its own right. You have to remember the child mortality was very high, even yes. in that time. People had huge families. Often several members of that family would die in childhood. One of Alice's own family, a younger brother, died when, how old was it? A few Three. days old. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and, and yes, there was another brother yeah, another died later on. Just, just so, so Six days. weeks old. So there was a sense about children of them being immensely precious. As Charlie said, Lewis Carroll himself referred to them as being fresh from the hand of God, but they were also close to God in, in the way people looked at it because they might 
any moment be taken back to God. Right. Yeah. So there was this this very strong. And I think it's even older than that. If mm -hmm. you look at mm -hmm. if you look at uh, art masterpieces of the past, the the, the the linking between cherubs, angels, and and child figures is is immensely strong. Mm -hmm. Walk through Highgate Cemetery, you mm -hmm. will see them immortalized in stone. And that's not sen and that's not sentimentality. No, you're talking all. about. You're talking about very very, realistic, very harsh reality. It is very yeah. harsh reality. Yeah. So we did a program about numbers in the last series, and of course, did 42 was, yes. a, was a, you know, recurred yes. throughout. And I didn't actually realise. Well, tell me about 42 in Alice. Edward is the great well, authority. It, it, it's probably Lewis Carr's favourite number. Um, the book has 42 illustrations. It had a copyright of 42 years, and he builds 42 into the text. Rule 42, all those more than a mile high should leave the courtroom. Alice is growing, and uh, the king is rather alarmed at, the, at her... Uh, her state of growth, and um, Alice sort of questions him on this, and he says, he says it's the oldest rule in the book. So Alice says, well, it ought to be number one. Change the subject. Right. You know, um, that's the way to get out of that one. Um, and then 42 reappears in Looking Glass. It was to have 42 illustrations, but there was a bit of a, um, um, a problem with it, and it actually became 50, but never mind. He intended it to have 42. And there are 4,207 soldiers. Uh, it also appears to 42, and 42 occurs uh, in his other works as well. Didn't the baker have 42 cases that yeah, they left on the floor? Careful yes, that. in the snark, and of course 10 and 6 months is a quarter 42, if you want to go that far. But there, there, there are some quite interesting 42s that are hidden within the text, which I think cannot be there purely through accident. I think they were put there by Lewis Carroll, and if I can qu quickly give you an example, uh, in Looking Glass, there's the, the red and white queen, the chess pieces, and they're talking to Alice about ages. And Alice says, I'm exactly seven and a half. And uh, the queen say, well, exactly, we are 100 and, 101 years, five months and a day. Now, it's Lewis Carroll writing this. It's not any old writer, it's Lewis Carroll, a mathematician. So 101 years, five months and a day must possibly have some significance. So you convert it to days. Problem. What months, what years? But the clue is, Alice says, I'm exactly seven and a half. Alice Little, who inspired the story, was born on May the 4th, 1852, and therefore you know it's November the 4th, which fits in with the fireworks, which actually are in the, uh, the text, so it all makes sense. It's November the 4th, 1857. So you can work out the leap years and the months, and you get this huge number at the end. And what is it? It's 42 cubed. <laughs> if you want to be what? simpler, if she's exactly seven and a half, that's seven years, six months, seven times six is 42. You but, you know, that's... Well, what Brian... <laughs> why why the, was it 42, uh, though, Edward? Why 42? I wish I knew. <laughs> I don't think anyone knows why 42. It's a sort of mystical well, number. Well, Lewis Carroll was born in 1832. Alice was born in 1852. 52. The famous river trip when the story 62. of Alice in Wonderland was told was 1862. Yes. Mi we're missing 1842. What about 72, then? Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, through the, through the Looking Glass was published in 18... I mean, I know well, it came out in 1871, but yes, the date on the title yes. page was 1872. Okay, 82. That's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Queen Victoria was the 42nd yes. monarch in line of yes. succession from William the Conqueror. There we are. And as my daughter pointed out to me the other day, she and Albert were both 42 at the time of Albert's death, which was just there you are. slightly before... <laughs> this is well something like really bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. Something really bizarre. bizarre. But I don't think any of those have anything to do with it. So <laughs> Lewis Carroll didn't choose the name Lewis Carroll until quite some time in his life. And he chose it... Well, he, he had put forward four possible names, and it was chosen by Edmund Yates, who was editing a magazine. What was wrong with Charles Dodgson? Well... Um, I, I think he wanted to separate his real name from his writing name. And, and he used both used names. He used Darius Charles Dodson for... and B.B. and other names, and they thought it wasn't actually a very appropriate pseudonym, and so he came up with Edgar Cuthwellis, an anagram on uh, Charles Latvich. Uh, not a brilliant name, uh, but nevertheless. And there was uh, Edgar U.C. Westhill, Louis Carroll, and Lewis Carroll. Lewis Carroll being derived from the Latin form of Charles Latvich. Charles Carolus Latvich Lewis, Ludovicus Lewis. Um, it was chosen on February the 11th, 1856, <laughs> and he died 
in 1898. He was Lewis Carroll for 42 years. So that's why he decided to die? Is that what <laughs> that's true. <serious, laughs> <that's laughs> but I mean, the, the extraordinary that's thing about That's 42, it is, I think. So 42 <laughs> was the answer to death, the universe and everything. Well, I'm just In glad Japanese, we didn't have... 42 is she ni death coming. You learn something new every day. But the interesting thing about all this is how much chance has played in this whole mm. story. I mean, if you think that... I mean, one of the things that Edward hasn't mentioned is that when he was toying with uh, original titles for... The, the, the story as he told it to Alice was called Alice's Adventures Underground. When he was going to publish it, he, he toyed with all kinds of ideas. He, didn't, he thought he could come up with a better title than that. One of them was Alice's Hour in Elfland. Now, would we all be here talking about this book if <laughs> it was published as Alice's Hour in Elfland by Edgar U.C. Westhill? I mean, I, <laughs> yes. I, I just ask you, would that have happened? I, I'm, I'm interested in the Graham, would, would you? <laughs> Probably not. No, no. It'd be, well, it'd be quite an obscure volume, wouldn't it, really? Yeah, probably. Of, of the I utmost know, rarity maybe not. You know, I, I think you've touched on something, though, because I, not too long ago we had a bunch of brouhaha about the 125th anniversary of the publication of Alice, and at the time I was the president of the American Lewis Carroll Society, and as a result, the phone would be ringing and I would be talking to radio in Chicago or newspaper in, in wherever. And this is the question they always ask, why is this book still popular after 125 years? And you can cite all the obvious reasons, but I also think there's this, there's this bit of chance. I mean, if we really knew what made a book or a film or a work of art a classic, well, we could all go out and do, what, do that right now, now, wouldn't we? You know? yeah. Well, you only have to look at how, how many of them are not successful yeah. mm. when they first appear. How many books, films, pieces well, of music, Alice was certainly not become a, cult later? Alice was certainly not an instant hit. You no. know, I, mean, no. you know what I would have thought Alice's Hour in Elfland by Edgar U.C. Westhill with illustrations by John Tenniel yes. might have survived. Just because mm. of John Tenniel. Maybe it would be right. one of the 60s books, wouldn't it? And collected Maybe. like that. Mm. Yes. Yes. I'm actually I'm interested in what you just said. I mean, when I was 16, I was in a play in Edinburgh and the author came along who was a Russian dissident to see it uh, and hated it and after and sort of said I hate it I think you're doing it terribly and then when he went out the room one of the other actors said to me um, what does he know he only wrote it yeah and, <laughs> Well, and Carroll was certainly also very actively involved in promoting his own work. And he was an entrepreneur. Else. I mean, the book was not published the way most books are published today, where you send it off to a publisher mm -hmm. and they say, yes, we accept this, we'll publish it. Lewis Carroll paid to have the book published. I mean, it was what we would call today almost a vanity publication. Mm -hmm. He paid a very fine publisher, Macmillan, to do it. And an expensive illustrator. And an expensive illustrator, mm -hmm. and he had it done well. I mean, to the point that when the first edition came back and he didn't feel that it was properly printed, uh, he was willing to trash the whole edition and start over and pay for another edition to be printed to, to make sure it was done right. But throughout his life, um, he did all sorts of things to promote the book. He was constantly writing his publisher with ideas about, um, you know, the, the way it should be marketed. He was uh, concerned that booksellers were getting too much of a cut and the author not enough of a cut in, in sales. Um, he was very instrumental in having the book uh, put on stage. He was instrumental in uh, inventing something called the the Wonderland postage stamp case. It was essentially, you know, a fun little thing, but let's face it, almost an advertisement for his own book mm. that people went out and bought. Uh, biscuit tin. The, the biscuit yes. tin, he was in, somewhat involved in that. Although he was sort of more pushed into that. I mean, he was and involved in getting course, translations. So, so there's no this doubt thing. that he had, he knew how to promote yeah. the book. And he, yeah, he, he brought it out in many, many different forms. Is and this the, uh, uh, the people's edition, you know, all haven't these sorts you got, of things. You've got one of the very first editions, haven't you? Yes. The, one, the ones that he decided that were not fit for sale. Really? But I have bought one anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> and if, if, if you have bought one of those? I've only got it in the, when it was rebound up for the first American edition as the Appleton Alice. So it's the same sheet. What happened was there were, there I do, were about... This is, this is the first um, mm -hmm. published edition. There were about 2,000 yes. copies that were printed. Came six months and, later. And of, of those 2,000 copies, 50 or fewer actually got bound up. And, and before the decision was made that the, mm -hmm. it was not worth uh, selling, to the English, and for a while they sat in a warehouse, and then finally they said, "Well, you know, we could sell it to the Americans. They don't know anything." About it. <coughs> Which, of course, we don't. So they sold it to the Americans with a new title page <laughs> slipped in, and a different publisher's name on the binding. So that you have now. I mean, if all the books had survived, they'd all survive. Mm. But they'd all survived. You'd had about 1,950 copies of the yes. the American version of the first edition, and about 50 or so copies of the English mm. version. In fact, there's 
about 20 or so copies of the, of the 1865 Alice, and I'm not sure how many of the 66s are there. But this happened because he, see, he, he, he was always looking for a new market mm -hmm. for translations yes. so that children in France and Germany and Italy could, could uh, read the story. So but he realized... This one that he, that he published himself and paid for, yes. the actual thing that yes, I'm holding right now. I don't think uh, he paid for this by this time. The, uh, the publishers were happy. Oh, but it was, no, 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 he was still yes. paying all the costs. And it, and it, was, it was certainly done at his yes. instigation, and but, he rewrote the text yes. for small children. But he thought, you know, he got the market from five to whatever. What about the children from naught to five? He was very conscious that there would be some younger children where their nannies or their mothers could read the story to them. So he uh, decided to produce the nursery Alice with coloured illustrations. I think that's Dodson, the educationalist, uh, coming across. Probably, but I also the entrepreneur there, yeah. looking for another market. Now you're coming to a, a, a particular page. If you turn so you say the entrepreneur, page, right, but it's not, the, it's now, not... If you see yeah. the picture on the left yeah. with the Cheshire cat, mm. now if you, if you turn the next page, you see the cat disappears. It's, and uh, if you look at that page, you see how it's creased? The child, please don't reinforce the crease because that will probably kill you. But um, <laughs> that is creased because he tells you in the book to fold the page it over is, so that yes. you can see the cat. It's actually nice to see a copy actually yeah, with the crease. Really and the child just did it. Yes. No, they've actually one, done it, haven't they? Yeah. Yes. And despite the fact that Edward's tried to iron the crease out, it's still. Have <laughs> 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 you tried to iron the crease? I've noticed that before. But, uh, <laughs> I think it should be said that this was one of his oh, most Edward successful books. Edward was always he never looks at books once he's done too many to look at. That makes the book even more precious. He printed I think ten thousand copies of this, and he had to. He was still at the time of his death discounting the price to try to get rid of them. And the other curious thing is that we always think of Alice as she is this figure here. Uh, wearing a blue dress with a white pinafore, and in, and in these illustrations, which were, mm. were were coloured by yeah, not by yellow. Tenniel, mm. uh, but by a friend of Lewis Carroll's, uh, she's wearing a yellow dress. So that shows you you I shouldn't believe everything. I think you I see finally figured out the blue dress. I mean, because I've known for a long time that the reason the blue dress became ubiquitous was because in Disney she has a blue dress. Why does she have a blue dress in Disney though? What does it go back to? And I thought, if you're a Disney animator in the late 1940s and you just pop down to the bookshop to get a copy of Alice that has something colored, what, what's going to be on the shelf? What's going to be on the shelf is an edition that was brought out by Random House in 1946 with the Tenniel illustrations colored by Fritz Kreidel in which I believe Alice has the blue dress. So little little that, Folks that, edition, 1900. Well, I know there are many that are earlier than that, but I'm saying this is, this is what, this is <laughs> <Yeah>. what <laughs> solidified <laughs> it. Yes, right. Mm, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, other thing, the other thing which is curious is that Tenniel was, uh, was a, a party to this promoting of the story mm. uh, quite shamelessly and although he took forever to make up his mind whether he wanted to illustrate the book and he had nightmares in working with Lewis Carroll because he was not the easiest of authors to work with uh, he was very quickly in the pages of Punch where, of which he was the leading cartoonist uh, he was very quickly parodying his own mm -hmm. illustrations That's in the right, books yeah. as political mm -hmm. cartoons mm -hmm. yep. and that's still going on I mean this is a, a, a cartoon from Punch sometime I guess in the 1960s I'm not absolutely sure of the date uh, by Michael Fuchs, which shows Queen Victoria knighting the white rabbit, as she says, for services to literature. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this is just one of hundreds of pictures. I think everyone's got a, f a favourite one of, by Michael Fuchs, who did lots and lots of, of, of Alice cartoons. Mm. You know, the one with, where, where the white rabbit is rushing into his house? Oh, yes. Uh, there's, a, there's a family of white rabbits, and, and, the, and the white rabbit comes in and says, there's this enormous girl who's chasing me. <laughs> <laughs> um, Can I'm, I ask for, just out of interest, you, you seem happier now. You weren't happy in the first part of No, I, well, I just wasn't happy that you suggested that our lives were obsessed with this, when, uh, in fact, as I said, this is one interest, I think, in all of our lives. We're all very different people, mm. and we all have lives other than this thing. Mm. Uh, and I just slightly resented the idea that we were being, we were being singled out as people who were, had an obsession, which I don't mm. think we do. I think we have a particular interest. I obsession. I don't think enthusiasm was... was no, I don't think it's enthusiasm. But you said it's taken over our lives, but I don't think it has. I think that, I think that almost anybody has interests in their lives, and if you look at an interest, mm. and you look at it in isolation from their other things, one of the things that I have found most gratifying about my interest in Lewis Carroll is that it has spiralled out into so many other things. Exactly. I just think it's important that everybody be passionate about something. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I've, I've been living in England for the last six months with my family and we've been trying to see a lot of the countryside and, and different parts of the country and so we've gone to places that have to do with Lewis Carroll. Uh, and my wife said, and quite rightly so, you know, if you're going to see England, you might as well see Lewis Carroll's England. You have to make some sort of choice about what places you're going to go see. You might as well have an excuse for going to a particular obscure little town up in Cheshire and a particular place down on the seaside and, and some particular um, nice 
lovely Georgian squares in London. You know. He's yeah. been to places that we haven't even been oh, it's, to. It's no, it's been been right. Right. I, th I think, I, I really believe that there's, mm. a, there's a, a real link between place and both literature and, and the nature of a person's uh, life and a, a person's soul. You know, I think we all have places that are, that are deeply mm. important to us. And uh, I think, for me, it's been uh, at times a revelation to be in the places that are deeply important to Lewis Carroll. Like, like knowing well, what where, I know where are the places you've been which Edward just said he hadn't been? Where have I been that you haven't been? Well, Spellsbury. But so I don't think Spellsbury was deeply to important to Lewis Carroll. Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> no, his diary. Well, but it is in his diaries, yes. It just happened to be near where I was living. We, we've done what these. did he write about Spellsbury in his diary? Well, he, this is a little uh, town in the Cotswolds. It's, oh, maybe 20 miles outside of Oxford. and. Um, he went up there once, oh, fairly early on, to because the the vicar was ill, and he went up there and took a service. And then later on, he had a cousin who um, was the vicar there, and he visited there on two or three occasions, and and uh, took a service on I think one or two of those occasions. But I mean, those places are all they're nice and fun to say, oh, I went to this place where Lewis Carroll went. But I, but the, what's interested me the most is going to the places that he had a real passion for. I mean, for instance, um, he spent. 20 some summers down in um, Eastbourne on the Channel Coast and he he and the young girls who went to visit him down there have written quite a bit about the sort of things that they used to do down there and it's very easy to sort of recreate what he did and one of the great things was he went and walked up on Beachy Head you know almost every afternoon the young girls would complain about having to walk all the way up to Beachy Head <laughs> and you know I'd read about this many many times and when I walked up on Beachy Head I started to understand that, that why this would be an important place, and that this would be a place where he would feel close to his God, I really think. I think it was a spiritual place for him, because it is, I mean, you talk about the, the young child as being uh, fresh from the hands of God. This is literally a landscape that feels like it's fresh from the hands of God, you know. And, and so to have those sorts of experiences, um, uh, I think, can, can enrich your understanding of somebody who, who thought that a certain place was important for a certain reason. It's one line. May the 29th, 1864, went over to Spilsbury, he even spelt it wrong actually, uh, near Charbury to help Barker, who was suffering from bronchitis. And he read the litany and preached in the morning. And that's probably the only reference there no, is to I, Spilsbury I think, in the whole I think there's diary. some later on. I, oh, think, I think there's a couple, because yes. one of the Wilcox yes. cousins becomes incumbent at Spilsbury oh, for right. a while. I was always intrigued as a, as a young child when I discovered that Lewis Carroll had visited. I grew up in a place called Chislehurst in Kent. Uh, and I discovered that Lewis Carroll had visited some friends there and he'd gone by train to the station. This was a, that he'd actually come into the place where I lived. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a, a rather battered uh, copy from 1870 of uh, um, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, which uh, you were talking about Eastbourne. And uh, another one of his uh, um, haunts was, uh, was Margate, although mm -hmm. he didn't like Margate quite so much because the, the, the quality of children was not quite so good. They right. tended to be of the commercial class. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is, uh, he was a snob. <laughs> he was a snob, yes. This is a child that he met, Ada, Chambers, Butler, and Edwards tracked down the reference to uh, the child in his diaries. And that's a copy that he just gave away to this child whom he met, whom he presumably had fun with. He listed her in the, in the diary as being one of his child friends that he'd met during the, during the time that he'd been at Margate. And there it is. And I, I think it should be you said, know. too, that uh, you know, we talked about him being shamelessly promotional about his own work, but he was also incredibly generous with his books. Yes, I mean, I mean he was constantly, friend, so, he? He constantly was kind, giving away books man. To, mm. to children and adults that he met, mm. and also arranging to have uh, books given to especially children's hospitals. He was especially yes. interested in that. And uh, uh, you know, lending libraries that would that not have the money in order to get children's books and these sorts of things. He's a tremendously generous man. Of course, we're busy searching for the uninscribed books because that probably <laughs> <laughs> no, not true at all, Edward. Um, one thing going slightly back to the obsession idea, it strikes me that in fact, in case we get accused of protesting too much, methinks that uh, it's quite possible to actually be totally obsessed, but narrowly within certain spaces of time. Mm. I mean, a great performer who's playing a bad fugue, in fact, in that situation. You said it as if it was a bad thing, but, but I think, it's, yeah. I think it's, it's, it's great, it's fine. Good. It's, 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 like life life it's, it's a trigger to other things, isn't it? So that, um, no, I, I, I mean, I'm sorry I, we keep going over this same ground, but I think that the, that the phrase to say that something has taken over people's lives suggests something which is 
which is a criticism. That is not the same thing as no, saying someone has a passion. I think we reserve that. That is a distinct yeah. thing. I, I, think I agree absolutely with Charlie word, that people yeah. should mm -hmm. have passions. And in mm -hmm. fact, this man who we've been talking about was a man of extraordinary passions. Oh, yeah. And his relatively short life, in many ways, was full and motivated and driven by those yeah. passions. I want to go on about this because I'm, so, I'm sorry to have upset you so much that... that um, well, it's the only controversy that we're managing to generate, so please <laughs> go on. So You've on. got go such on. a cynical mind, Brian. I can't believe it. Everything I say, you're, you're taking as, as, as some... I like I'm why. entrapping you or something. <laughs> I'm, I'm, really, I'm really shocked. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm done no. surely shocked. trying to be nice, and, and, <laughs> and you, you, you feel like I'm trying to... You're doing, You're doing wonderfully. You're doing wonderfully. Well, there are times when people come into our houses and they look around and they think, oh my God, what have I gotten into? Because there's Alice on the wall and Alice on the shelves and Alice on the carpet in some places. And, and, and so it does sort of have this look of obsession. And I think we, we tend to be a little bit defensive to say, mm. no, we're, we're normal people. It's okay. You can come in. But I do think that the most interesting people I have known are people who are very passionate about something. Yeah. Not necessarily who I was feel that way about Randy Newman. Something, anything. Do you really? Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. Oh, that's good. So but they, you, but it, I know, but it's not taken a, over my life. It hardly, is it? Well, OK, no, no. I've got Randy Newman <laughs> wallpaper. No. But that's because they haven't actually made it. <laughs> they, they, they when they figured it out. Now. Yeah. Yeah.